Hi guys this is Hirasaki. This story is all about what if Naruto was entrusted with a legendary gift. When Naruto is given a gift considered legendary even in a world where walking on water is a daily occurrence for some, will it lead him on a path towards peace, or will the consequences of said gift leave a hole in his heart too large to fill? Before we start kindly like and subscribe to this channel, and look over the description box for the author of this amazing storyline. Welcome aboard. Chapter 70, Clouds 8 Naruto groaned with irritation as he crushed another of the disgusting fleshy snakes under his sandal. He had the displeasure to watch as what he thought was Kasuna's unconscious body dissolved into a small nest of the writhing, wriggling things. With another sigh he casually wiped his sandal against the dusty ground, trying to get little bits of the purple creatures off his heel as he looked around the forest. He couldn't sense anybody else in the near vicinity so he knew Kasuna had taken off at some point in the fight, or he hadn't been there at all. He was just unfortunate that with all the dark chakra in the shinobi's body he couldn't tell the clone from the original. Man, I hate clones. Naruto paused at that, feeling as though he had said something inherently hypocritical, yet he couldn't for the life of him fathom fathom why. He shook his head of it as he walked from the clearing, not giving the crushed remains of the poisonous snakes a backwards glance. A few blurred jumps later, and he had reached the tree branch he had left Cheyenne on, unfortunately, the pale blonde-haired priestess was nowhere to be seen. Naruto just ran hand through his hair as he looked about, sighing irritably, would it kill the girl to follow instructions? Cheyenne stumbled again as her feet caught in the low bushes and awkwardly placed roots that littered the forest floor. She was no fool, she wasn't waiting around to be caught in the inevitable crossfire she had always heard erupted between people using chakra. However, as her clothes continued to be caught by low-hanging branches and irritating twigs she began to regret breaking away from Naruto. She paused, coming to a stop in a particularly dense area of the forest where only a few meager rays of sunlight pathetically streamed in. Um, hello? She looked around, hoping to see a familiar face blur into existence nearby, hell, even Taiyuya would be a welcome sight right now. Monk. Her head whipped around when she heard a slight rustling behind her, only turning in time to see the bushes settle. From the wind? Yes, she convinced herself it had to be just the wind, she was letting the dark and the isolation get to her. She was a proud priestess of Oni no Kuni, she shouldn't let little things like. Ah. Her scream resonated around the area as a hand suddenly rested on her shoulder, causing her to spin around and naturally strike out at the perpetrator. However, she was surprised when her wrist was easily caught in a firm grip, her eyes going wide and beginning to brim with tears. Taroho. The young man smiled pleasantly at her when she rushed forward, burying her face in his chest. The man just smiled gently as he returned the hug, slowly wrapping his arms around her smaller frame. The young priestess never saw the thin purple snakes that emerged from the man's sleeves, rearing back slowly with their dripping fangs bared. Cheyenne Sama. Similarly, the little fleshy snakes never saw the flash of the blade that separated their heads from their bodies. The priestess looked around in shock as she felt the blade rush past her hair, pushing off of the Taroho holding her as another entered the clearing. Tita Roho? Cheyenne stared in confusion as the two identical men glared across at one another, their swords raised in almost mirrored perfection. The young girl backed away from them, now unsure who her real attendant was, they both looked identical. Damn it she wasn't a shinobi or a kunoichi, she couldn't detect a henge or whatever it was the monk had called it. Cheyenne sama you have to get away for your own safety. One of the Tarohos looked to her while still keeping his sword trained on the other him. The other bespectacled man looked around as well, sowing the same concern in his brown eyes. Don't listen to that imposter Cheyenne Sama, if you run away, you'll be led right into their trap. The two men resumed glaring at one another as Cheyenne stood still, indecisively, she didn't know what to do. Quiet you shinobi scum. The two men continued to adjust their stances in perfect mockeries of one another, lending no credit to either being the real Taroho. No, you be quiet you pretender. Cheyenne watched helplessly as the two men began to shuffle forward, 
keeping their stances level as they readied themselves to attack. Stop! Stop this both of you! Both Tarujos froze in place as they looked around at the girl, both of them confused by her sudden outburst. Only one of you is the real Tarujo, so I'm ordering you both to put down your blades. She surprised herself with the authority she managed to muster in her voice, it contrasted how weak and helpless she felt inside. However, to her dismay neither of the brown-haired men made a move to comply with her demand. I am sorry Cheyenne-sama, but when your safety is at risk, I must ignore your commands. Cheyenne widened her eyes at one of the men before the other turned to her, just as much sincerity in his voice. I'm afraid the same goes for me Cheyenne-sama. And as if an unspoken signal had been given the two samurai rushed forward, their identical blades meeting in a clash of sparks and metal. From there Cheyenne had trouble seeing what was going on, Toroho may not have been a shinobi, but he was a proud samurai before he had become her attendant, and he could use chakra to enhance his movements. Their blows became a blurs of movement, their feet almost vanishing as they twisted and turned around one another, vying for superiority. Finally, they disengaged for a moment, one of them now bearing a few scratches across their arms and clothing. Your appearance may be a perfect duplicate, but you could never master the art of the sword like a true samurai. The injured Toroho just scowled as his features began to melt away, revealing the white-haired shinobi that had previously tried to perform the very same trick. This might have been amusing at first, but without that monk around it's pointless. Toroho merely set his features as he's shifting his stance again, causing the white-haired shinobi to smirk viciously. Oh, this isn't a sword game anymore boy, let me show you how shinobi fight. The man suddenly vanished in a flicker of movement, causing Toroho to sweat as he lost sight of him. The bespectacled attendant looked left, left and right, checking behind him, and even above him for the next attack, frowning when he couldn't figure out what was going on. Wrong again. Before Toroho could realize what the slightly muffled voice meant, for fleshy snakes burst from the ground beneath him, coiling around him faster than he could move before tightening painfully. The attendant grunted from the sudden constriction as he lost his grip on his sword. He found he could barely move a muscle as one of the snakes suddenly appeared before his face, bared fangs dripping with a noxious smelling, viscous purple fluid. Toroho. Cheyenne tried to rush forward and help one of her oldest confidants, but it was too late, the snake lunged forward, biting deeply into his neck. The man cried out from the pain, causing Cheyenne to freeze as she literally watched the poisonous chakra spread through his veins, ugly marks appearing around the infected skin. At the same moment Kasuna melted out of the ground as if it were water, grinning viciously at the captured swordsman. Little men holding pointy sticks should know better that to face a shinobi. We are your superiors in every way samurai. The snake suddenly released the man, allowing him to fall bonelessly to the ground, twitching from the pain of the poison. Cheyenne wasted no time rushing over to his form, collapsing to her knees beside the man. All right, priestess, it's your turn now. Cheyenne ignored the shinobi though, tears beginning to gather at the edges of her vision as she gently shook Toroho's unmoving arm. Tita Roho? She couldn't believe it, she had seen it, this exact moment, she had seen it in a vision, but she just couldn't believe it had actually happened. It was never supposed to be Toroho, not him, she just refused to believe it as she knelt there, shaking his body. No Toroho please, not you please. More tears welled up in her eyes, staining her cheeks as they rolled uncontrollably down her pale skin. Well Miko-sama, you really can show an emotion other than irritation. Irritation. Cheyenne's eyes widened a little as the body in front of her suddenly vanished in a puff of smoke. Behind her Naruto suddenly descended from a high branch, quickly followed by a rather shell-shocked Toroho, the real one this time. But I think you should save your tears for now. The pale blonde just looked up, wiping at her eyes as she saw the very much real and alive form of her attendant standing right there. Toroho. She leapt at the man, catching him off guard as he was suddenly tackled to the floor. I I thought you were. It was just like in my vision, I thought. She couldn't say any more as she buried her head in the chest of the closest thing she had to family since her mother passed. Toroho just smiled as he gently stroked her hair in a calming gesture. 
I am glad Shayan-sama is safe. The two went ignored though as Naruto stood forward to face a very irritated Kasuna who was seething and already looking around for an escape. How? Naruto chuckled as he lazily swung his Shikuja back and forth, the picture of innocence as the streaming light from above them lit him up. You aren't the only one that knows the hange. I'm just lucky Fu decided to teach me the substitution technique, it really came in handy here. A few seconds later, and that would have really been Toroho infected by the horrible chakra you guys use. Kasuna continued to seethe as he slowly backed up, knowing he was no match for the young monk. The plan had been to lure him away long enough to deal with the priestess with the dark chakra clone, but even that hadn't worked. Worked. It doesn't matter monk, we'll get the priestess eventually. Even you can't stand against Moriyasama's full might. He made to dart from the clearing, but found his path blocked by great walls of sand that had risen up without him even noticing. He turned fearfully to see Naruto striding toward him, eyes set and Shikuju held firmly in his hand. I showed you the folly of attacking the priestess back at the temple. Kasuna rushed forward, hoping to blindsight the monk with a quick attack, but Naruto wasn't fooled, easily diverting the punch to the side with his staff before striking him solidly in the chest with two outstretched fingers, you didn't listen. Kasuna gaped as he felt his right arm go completely numb, falling limply to his side. I told you politely not to attack us again after leaving the temple. Ten fleshy snakes suddenly burst from Kasuna's back, all aiming their deadly venom for the young monk. However once again it was ineffective as Naruto's hands began to warp the air from the heat radiating off of them. He lashed out, scorching and burning the snakes like they were paper the moment they got anywhere near him, before once again lashing out with another lightning-infused palm strike. This time it was Kasuna's other side that went limp, effectively leaving him defenseless before his frighteningly calm opponent. And again, you failed to listen. At this point Kasuna's eyes had gone wide with fear as he found his back up against the intimidating wall of sand. To the side Cheyenne and Toroho had broken out of their reverie, reverie, and were looking at the confrontation with shock. Thin but strong arms of sand burst from the makeshift wall, wrapping around the rogue shinobi and binding him there firmly. This time I'm not going to ask you or show you. Naruto's eyes hardened as he brought his shikuju around in a smooth flourish, spinning it elegantly. I am going to tell you. With a powerful jab Naruto slammed the end of the old monk's tool straight into Kasuna's chest, sending the shinobi crashing through the wall of sand in a surprising display of strength. When he stepped through the gaping hole he had made he saw his opponent lying weakly on the ground, unable to move his body or even access his chakra anymore. You aren't going to hurt anybody anymore because now you can't. Hesitantly Cheyenne and Toroho followed him through the hole in the sand construct that was now beginning to dissipate back into the earth. Arg. Kasuna suddenly twitched on the ground, his veins becoming more pronounced and turning a darker, sicklier purple. His skin became pale and pallid as before the three's very eyes his body seemed to wither away, becoming thin and weak. What's happening to him? Cheyenne was staring in disgust as the man just seemed to age a few decades before their eyes, withering away to a mere husk of his former self. I took away his ability to use chakra, without it he can no longer control the darker chakra that's been implanted into his body. As if to prove that a multitude of those horrible fleshy snakes burst from the man's body, quickly wriggling away before they too simply dissipated into a noxious purple smoke. So, he's still alive? Naruto nodded grimly, never taking his eyes off of the desiccated shinobi. But he'll never be a threat to anybody ever again, that dark chakra he so recklessly used will see to that. Finally, when the defeated man stopped, stopped twitching, but Naruto was still sure he was alive he looked away, letting out a deep breath. Right, we should go find the others, we still have a job to do right. Cheyenne took one last look at the withered husk of a man lying on the ground before wiping away the last of the tears staining her cheeks and nodding determinately. The group had managed to find each other again not long after their individual fights were over, continuing their dash across country towards Numa no Kuni. They had arrived very close to where the ceiling ground was hidden just as the moon was reaching its zenith in the sky. 
Despite protests to the contrary from Cheyenne they had all agreed it would be best to wait a night before continuing so they were all well rested for what was to come. Even Tarujo agreed although that was unsurprising considering how exhausted the man appeared after the almost day-long sprint. However, once they had all gotten ready to sleep and the briefly lit campfire had been extinguished a lone shadow slipped out of their tent. They made sure to make a wide passage around Fu's tent as they knew the mint-haired girl was quite possibly the lightest sleeper ever. Finally, they breathed a small sigh of relief as they got a sufficient distance from the campsite, looking out toward the direction of the ceiling ground. Going somewhere Miko-sama? The poor priestess nearly jumped out her skin as the soft voice suddenly spoke up from above her. She looked up with jerky, robotic movements to see Naruto look down at her with an amused expression from his position standing horizontally on the trunk of a tree. I I needed the bathroom. Naruto just raised an eyebrow as he dropped from the tree, landing without even a whisper of sound next to the startled priestess. So far from the camp? Cheyenne stuttered for a moment before scowling at the team, crossing her arms over her chest as the fire relit in her. Yes, what of it? Naruto just shrugged nonchalantly walking back in the direction of the camp with a small chuckle. Nothing, have a nice night Miko-sama. Cheyenne watched the boy go for a few moments to check he was really gone before breathing a long sigh of relief. Quickly and as quietly as she could she took off in the other direction, this time jogging, so she could get away from the others as quickly as possible. It was only after another few minutes of running through the forest that she finally broke out of the tree line, finding herself standing on the edge of a cliff, looking down over the site of the ceiling shrine. Wow, you really like your privacy if you need to go this far. Cheyenne just nodded absently before blanching, looking around slowly to see Naruto right next to her, crouching down to look over the ceiling site with an interested expression. What are you doing here? She nearly screamed it, but managed to control herself and simply ground it out between clenched teeth in a hoarse whisper. Naruto simply looked around and cocked his head in mock confusion before grinning disarmingly, catching the young priestess of guard. I promised you I would protect you, didn't I? That includes when you foolishly run off so you don't have to endanger the people you care about anymore. Cheyenne felt her body go lip with surprise for a moment before she managed to catch herself, scowling at the teen. What are you talking about, monk? I came out here because I saw no reason to wait any longer, you only give those shinobi more time to get here. Naruto sighed with a lilting smile on his face as he turned back towards the ceiling ground, the entire area outside of it was littered with odd mounds of recently disturbed earth. What makes you think they aren't here already? He casually picked up a small pebble before throwing it in a long arc through the air. It landed with a scrabbling sound near the middle of the large, flat area outside of the cave where Moria was sealed. All of a sudden, the closest of the burial mound-like structures burst open, revealing a tall, broad statue-like being covered in intricate, traditional armor that looked around for a few moments for the source of the disturbance. When it didn't find anything, it squatted back down, piling earth back on top of itself as camouflage, it never heard Cheyenne's slight gasp of surprise. Emoria's ghost army, and I was about to walk out there. Cheyenne paled at the thought of walking out amongst hundreds of virtually invulnerable stone soldiers that wouldn't hesitate to destroy her without mercy or even conscious thought. You know, I'm almost surprised you would do something so noble. Cheyenne shook her head, Naruto's voice managing to somehow worm into her mind and settle her doubts for the moment, it just had a very soothing effect on her, at least until she thought back to what he actually said. Stop twisting my actions, monk. I already told you I just didn't see the point in waiting any longer. Naruto just smiled at her, absently blowing a stray lock of his hair away from his face. Sure, and it had nothing to do with Toroho. Cheyenne froze at that, looking at the other blonde with shock while he simply looked out over the plateau again. W what do you mean? Naruto chuckled before sighing lightly, still avoiding Cheyenne's gaze. You know, it isn't a sign of weakness to say you are doing something for the sake of another. In fact all my life I have seen examples of people becoming truly strong because they have chosen to fight or act in the protection of their loved ones. 
Cheyenne seemed a little lost as the monk finally turned to her, his deep rippled eyes meeting hers. But, how can I do it? Cheyenne looked down, her shoulders shaking slightly as she felt the emotional walls, she had spent your building up cracking under the monk's soft gaze. One day I'll wake up, my bell will ring and I'll see his death. Then I will just have to wait for it, unable to do anything to stop it. She jerked a little when he felt Naruto rest his hand on her shoulder, making her look up. You can't believe that just because you see the future doesn't mean there's nothing you can do to stop it. You have to keep hoping that there is some way to change it. Lose that hope, and then there really is nothing to do but wait and watch it happen for real. He smiled lightly and held out his hand while Cheyenne just stared at it dumbly. Come on, just this once I'll let you be selfish. After a small moment's hesitation Cheyenne gently took the offered hand, however, she was unprepared as Naruto suddenly took off from the ground, leaping right over the plateau and taking her with him. W what are you doing? She thought her voice might have been lost in the rushing winds as the two practically glided through the air, however Naruto seemed to hear her anyway, turning and smiling at her. For just a moment the young monk was framed by the moon, the ethereal light it cast making his golden hair glow, and just like that Cheyenne lost her voice. The moment passed though and after another few seconds they touched down softly on the other side of the plateau, right next, next to the mouth of the cave. Right, go on then. I'll be with you in a few minutes. Cheyenne blinked, looking between the blonde and the cave entrance, she could practically feel the great power that was locked inside. You aren't coming? Naruto just smiled comfortingly as he gestured backwards with his hand. I'll be dealing with those. Cheyenne looked over his shoulder to see the multitude of earthen mounds begin to break apart, revealing the intimidating stone warriors encased within. Are you going to be okay? Naruto simply grinned, holding up a strange cross-like hand seal she had never seen before. In a few puffs of bright white smoke there were suddenly five other Naruto's standing in a line. I'll be fine, now go on, you'll be fine on your own for a bit. He turned, facing the oncoming army of supposedly invulnerable soldiers approaching them slowly. However, Cheyenne was frozen in place, unable to move out of fear, she didn't know what awaited her in that cave it could be anything from one of the shinobi to Moriyu himself. As if sensing her trepidation the original Naruto turned to her even as the others dashed off, reappearing at the edges of the plateau, surrounding the army. It's a right Cheyenne, you're stronger than you think, just remember what you are doing this for. Cheyenne looked up at the older blonde with wide eyes, that was the first time he had called her by her actual name. Thank you. Naruto. The blonde just grinned as he turned to the oncoming horde, allowing Cheyenne to turn and jog into the ominous dark of the cave. Cave. The blonde just grinned at the approaching warriors, slipping into an identical stance to the one being taken by the rest of his clones. Cheyenne turned back to see the blonde one last time just as he began his technique, allowing her to witness something incredible. Each blonde took a deep breath, calming themselves as they limbered up their muscles before their eyes snapped open, each whispering as one. Mizu no Mai Itaika. Then, just like that, the blondes vanished in perfect synchronization. They were mere blurs, darting and dodging through the stone soldiers like water through pebbles in a stream. They would simply lay their hands on one of the statues, and in mere moments it would crumble away into dust, the chakra leaving its body. However oddly when they touched the next statue nothing seemed to happen, in fact, they seemed to become a little bit faster. Cheyenne worried, thinking Naruto's technique wasn't working however she began to notice it would happen every time, one touch would disintegrate, the other, in power. It was like some great, intricate dance as each Naruto sped through the ranks of the ghost army, each one slowly spiraling towards the center like the arms of a great whirlpool. It was hypnotizing to watch as they got progressively faster at the same rate the surviving statues seemed to become stronger. Cheyenne shook herself out of her daze as she tore her eyes away from the amazing technique, turning and running off into the cave, she trusted Naruto to get through this. Finally, she emerged from the darkness of the cave into a vast, open area that seemed to stretch on into darkness in every direction without end. end. The entire place was lit by the bubbling lava across the round, the room only made passable by the intricate and complex series of earthen bridges, 
only a scant few feet above the dangerous molten rock below. The priestess didn't let that intimidate her as she walked on, toward the center of the great room, where the seal still bound Moria's body. You've grown. The voice stopped her in her tracks, it was deep, dark and unnatural, and her mind screamed at her to run from it even as her feet refused to budge. She turned slowly, spotting the dark-haired man that had been waiting for her, sitting slumped over in his regal chair. Slowly he looked up, revealing eyes that had lost their humanity long ago, eyes that froze her in place out of fear. You look like Morocco. Naruto continued to duck and weave between the powerful stone golems, constantly pulling and pushing chakra in and out of the rock warriors. The whole basis of this technique was to whittle down the numbers of a very large crowd by pulling the chakra from some before immediately pushing it into others without even fully drawing it into his body. Luckily for him it was perfect for this vile chakra empowering the statues as he didn't want it in his body to begin with, it would probably destabilize his clones. The other principle was to mess with his opponent's control by pushing more chakra into their bodies, however, in this case it only seemed to make the golem stronger. Either way he continued with his dance, constantly aware of his clone's move movements through their shared vision and their position in the larger spiral they were slowly creating. Eventually, as the numbers of statues continued to drop, their movements became faster and faster, as if reacting to some increasing tempo only they could hear. Then, finally, Naruto pivoted on his foot in perfect harmony with his clones, slamming his hands in a double palm strike into the chest of one of the last statues, at the exact moment his clones did the same to theirs. He pushed all of the enormous chakra he had slowly gathered in his dance straight into the construct, watching it freeze from the sudden influx of the dark chakra. He took a step back, an action mirrored by his clones, watching as the sick remaining ghost warriors started to shake, the overload of chakra in their bodies too much for them to handle. He breathed a sigh of relief as the stone soldiers simply disintegrated from the enormous chakra in their artificial bodies, running his head in direction of the cave. There was something there blocking his ability to sense fully, like there wasn't enough moisture in the air, however, he could see enough to know Cheyenne was alive and had begun to perform the sealing ritual. There was another signature there, but it was weak and it didn't seem to be doing any. Cheyenne. Naruto's eyes widened as the signature suddenly rocketed towards the girl, the previously weak chakra exploding outward into an almost oppressive presence. He turned to run towards the cave as his clones dissipated into smoke only to be blocked off by even more of the stone golems. They were filtering in from the edge of the plateau, seemingly endless in their number. Naruto just growled at the ones that stood between him and the ceiling shrine, building up the chakra within him to blinding levels. I promised her I would protect her. I will not break that promise again. Now. Get out of my way. In front of him the ghost army just seemed, seemed to implode on themselves as the gravity around them magnified to unbearable levels, crushing rock into fine dust. However, as many as Naruto destroyed there always seemed to be more, only existing to keep him away from the shrine where he could protect Cheyenne. He spun on a heel, aiming to destroy another of the brutes when it suddenly froze in front of him. A moment later the top half of it simply slid off the bottom half from a previously invisible cut. I don't like it when you take off without me. I get worried. Naruto had never been happier to hear Fu's deadpan, slightly irritated tone as the girl dropped down beside him, water swords held firmly in hand. It's good to see you Fu, unfortunately, I need to go help our priestess. Think you can hold these things off? The mint-haired girl just nodded quickly as she bisected another of the lumbering golems, watching with thinly veiled interest as the two halves continued to walk forward for a few steps before crumbling away. Naruto used the opportunity to dash off, confident Fu would be able to handle herself. He darted into the cave, sprinting down the long passage that opened up into the great, late-filled chamber. That at least explained why his water sense didn't seem to be able to work to its fullest. Naruto. He skidded to a halt as he looked over to where he could see Cheyenne kneeling at the center of what looked to be a large, complicated ceiling array carved into the rock. He was just in time to see the ground around her break apart as huge tendrils of shadow burst from the earth, scattering stone and molten rock in all directions. 
At the same moment the ground underneath Shion just seemed to give way beneath her, giving the priestess only a moment to lock her whitened eyes with Naruto's before she fell into the chasm of darkness. Shion. Naruto froze for a moment, watching the girl fall before he was forced to dodge out of the way as a massive pillar of pure dark chakra sl slammed down where he had been standing. He rolled to a stop, looking up at the four great dragon heads that had congealed from the solid chakra, they stared back at him with dark, glowing red eyes that seemed to mock him. Give her back. He could have sworn the dragons grinned before they rushed at him, each aiming to swallow him whole. He dodged them all, landing on another of the flimsy earthen walkways where he knelt for a few moments. The dragons recollected themselves turning and roaring at the young blonde, seemingly mindless as Moria's true consciousness was elsewhere. The air seemed to become still as Naruto finally looked up, opening his eyes slowly, however, when he did the great demon seemed to rear back with cacophonous wails. They cried because Naruto's eyes had changed, they were now a startling gold. Shion was lost, floating in an endless void of darkness that had no end of beginning, there was nothing here, truly nothing. This was her end, the powers of her bell would not protect her forever, then. The girl tucked herself into a ball, closing out the dark chakra surrounding her, willing it to just go away. However, the malevolent presence that was entwined within this place would never be so easy to defeat. Is this its little priestess? Is this truly your end? To sit here and while away your time while the races of man crumble around you? Safe inside your little bubble? Cheyenne tried to ignore the voice, but it was everywhere, it was the dark fog that surrounded her, it whispered and echoed in her mind even now. Do you not think there is a better way little priestess? Join with me, return my full power to me, your mother understood. Cheyenne looked up, spotting the small pinprick of light in the eternal darkness of this place. Mother. She didn't notice her little bubble of light slowly fade around her as she unfurled her body, looking up toward that glowing, hovering light. Cheyenne. It really was her, Cheyenne got to her knees, looking up at the light as she reached out a hand, her protective sphere of light weakening and flickering around her. The darkness around her seemed to sense the weakness, the fog and mist seemingly drawing in closer around the young teen. Yes, just accept it little priestess. Give in to me, be with your dear mother again. Cheyenne reached out, feeling as though she could almost touch the little hovering light, however just before she did she froze, fingers only a few inches away. And no. Naruto's words flashed through her mind as she took her hand back, she had to remember why she was here, to protect the people she cared about. She couldn't do that if she gave up, she would be letting Moria win. No, she wouldn't allow it. No. She pulled back, the bright light around her strengthening as the dark voice seemed to scream in pain. I I understand now, this power. She gripped the bell pin to her jacket as the light became blinding, casting back the shadowy fog. However, before she could fully release the power contained within her she froze as a warm hand rested on her shoulder. You've done great Cheyenne. She looked around, tears brimming in her eyes as the young monk stepped up beside her a soft smile on his face as he gazed at her with brilliant golden eyes. Naruto Chapter 71, Clouds 9 The, mis the misty darkness seemed to tremble with rage as Naruto took a step forward to stand beside Shion, the golden eyes of his sage mode burning with chakra. Thin tendrils of the fog seemed to flinch back from his form as if visibly burned by his sheer presence. With one hand he held a tight grip on his shikuju, with the other he kept a firm hand on Cheyenne's shoulder, to remind the girl she wasn't alone in this dark, dismal place. No, this is impossible. How could you possibly be here? Naruto ignored the voice for now, turning and looking at Cheyenne, making sure her full attention was on him and not on the demon. You've done great so far Cheyenne, but there's still something we have to do. The priestess nodded uncertainly, unable to tear her gaze away from Naruto. As a priestess she had an inherent connection with the natural world and chakra, and right now it was like looking straight into the heart of the world itself. The chakra emanating off of Naruto was so unbelievably pure and powerful it was as though she was next to her mother again. Not only that but it was so bright, 
so very bright that even the dark, malevolent chakra surrounding them could only flee from it. W.E.? She barely registered his words, too lost in the deep molten gold his eyes had become, a symbol of his connection with nature and its energy. Naruto simply grinned as he turned away, breaking the spell over Shion to gesture out at the abyssal world they had entered. Of course, we have to do something about this, don't we? His voice was so confident, his stance firm, and his eyes so warm, Shion could do nothing but nod as he turned back, his gaze softening once again. Come on Shion, I can't do this without you. The darkness seemed to vibrate around them as the light only Shion could see surrounding the blonde became visible, almost blindingly so as Naruto's chakra level soared to unprecedented heights. You! You are the one that bears the accursed samsara I... Naruto paused for a a moment, the bright glow around his body fading just a little as he turned back out towards the darkness. You know about my eyes? The darkness almost immediately reacted to the teen's dimming, dark tendrils of fog twisting and contorting around the two until a large amorphous face appeared made from fog. Its two burning red eyes glared at the pair, but more so Naruto as rippled eyes filled with confidence met red eyes filled with millennia of hatred. Of course, even in my world I hear whispers of those eyes that felled even the mighty Shinju, the one who came before, the godman. Naruto's eyes narrowed a little as the darkness continued to twist and writhe around them. He was the epitome of you humans, but while he was a man, you are just a child. The face in front of them grinned as it moved closer, only to grimace as Naruto sent it reeling back, the light around his body only burning hotter and brighter. With my power in those eyes, there would be nothing on this earth that could stand in my way, even my own body of flesh and blood could not compare. Naruto just grimaced as he felt the great demon's eyes roam his form with greed and desire. Sorry, I already have tenants, and I don't think they would appreciate the company. Moria screamed as Naruto soon became too bright to look at, the face of mist and fog dissipating back into the all-consuming darkness of the murky world. However, to Shion it was just a warm, comforting light that bathed the monk, casting away the shadows. You will regret this monk. I will destroy you, this world and all of the worthless humans that inhabit it. Naruto ignored the demon though, turning back around to Shion and gently clasping her hand in his own with a small smile. Come on, this world is far too grim, we should really do something about it. Shion didn't even know what to say for a few moments before she found her voice, smiling back at the monk. Right. She felt as though the blonde's grin lit up the darkness even more than his powerful aura, as he reached across, pulling her small crystal bell off her jacket. You know I thought there was something special about this, I guess I'm about to find out. He held out the hand holding the bell and Shion quickly placed her own around it, both feeling it as the small ornament began to glow with its own light equaling that of Naruto's. The blonde could only watch with amazement and an ever-growing smile as pure, harmonizing nature chakra burst from the bell, rushing through Shion's body as it naturally molded with the chakra already present. I I feel it. Before his eyes Shion seemed to change, her body glowing with an unearthly light as pink markings appeared below her eyes and in the center of her forehead. Naruto almost wanted to laugh from the revelation, it was sage mode. Nature chakra rushed through both of their bodies like raging rivers as their glow only grew brighter and brighter, casting back the shadows and causing Moria to scream as the purifying light burned away his blackened soul. Fo dashed down the darkened hallway-like cave as fast as she could, her sand sandaled feet pounding against the hard rocky floor. Ahead of her something roared loud enough to shake the entire cave causing the ceiling to crack and a few loose rocks to fall down overhead. She skidded to a stop in the massive chamber, staring with wide eyes at the enormous construct of dark chakra at the center. It was as if some nightmarish hydra had bust from the lava that filled the floor, roaring and thrashing about as the demon tried to gain purchase in this world. Naruto was nowhere to be seen and Fu was worried, she had completely lost track of his chakra not long after he rushed in here, lost amongst the oppressive feel of Moryu's. However, even as she watched she realized that the dragon-like heads of the demon weren't moving randomly, it looked more like they were writhing in pain. 
Sure enough a single long streak of pure white light suddenly burst from whatever dark dimension the demon had come from, shortly followed by another, and another. Soon a multitude of great cracks of white light appeared over the beast before with one last deafening cry of pain the body of Moriu exploded outward in one massive dome of brilliant white light. When Fu finally lowered her arm from protecting her eyes she looked on in shock as she saw Naruto standing right at the center of it all, bathed in a slowly fading glow. Around them great chunks of a dark ash-like substance floated down from above them, burning or smoldering. With a start Fu realized it was what remained of Moria's body, after whatever Naruto had done to it. However, she quickly saw the monk wasn't alone as in his arms, peacefully asleep, lay Shion, a light, lilting smile on her features. Naruto! Naruto! When the blonde caught sight of her he waved with a grin causing Fu to smirk, Leave it to Naruto to act so nonchalantly after destroying an evil that had been plaguing the country for hundreds of years. He stopped though when the sleeping priestess in his arms stirred lightly, it made him smile to see the younger teen so peaceful. You did great Shion, you'll make a fine priestess yet. As he and Fu left the ceiling ground neither of them noticed the small blush accompanied by a tiny smile spread across the younger girl's face. I'm sorry you couldn't find what you were looking for here. All five teens stood in the ornate hall of the Oni no Kuni temple, Cheyenne sat before them, the picture of elegance and regal bearing as she addressed them, wearing her full regalia as the proud priestess of her nation. The four teens knelt opposite her in size of positions, however, despite the formal feeling in the air they were relaxed, and the atmosphere was purely friendly. It's all right, a friend once told me that it isn't necessarily about finding what you were looking for, just as long as you find something worthwhile. Naruto sent a subtle glance Haku's way as he spoke making the darker-haired teen smirk. Shion sat before them in silence for a few moments, still appearing perfectly poised and rigid before a grin broke out over her face, any tenseness in the air breaking immediately. I really will be sad to see you all leave you know, even Taiyuya. The redhead naturally scowled at the young priestess, but there was no venom behind it, it was just playful. The days they had spent at the shrine after Moria's defeat had gone a long way to mending any problems Cheyenne might have caused between the two. After her outlook on life had changed the girl had become carefree, happy, and it became hard to stay mad at her. Although that wasn't to say she had lost that certain spark about her that just made her uniquely. Cheyenne. And we will, we will be sad to go, it always is that way when leaving friends. Cheyenne chuckled light-heartedly at Naruto's words relaxing out of her rigid Saiza into a more comfortable position with her legs folded to her side. You speak as though we will never see each other again. Naruto just grinned at that, his shikuju jingling as he tilted his head. Oh, we'll definitely meet again. Cheyenne smiled amusedly, her eyes light and carefree. A prediction? Naruto simply grinned right back as he stood up, hand held out. A promise. Cheyenne nodded concedingly, standing up and gently taking the offered hand. Very well, but don't think I won't hold you to that. She sighed a little wistfully as she looked up at the teen that had changed her life, in more ways than one. Such a shame that your heart already belongs to another. She looked around at Fu whose orange eyes were observing her carefully, looking for any underhanded moves from the priestess. It didn't take a genius to see that she had developed more than a small crush on the young monk after everything he had done for her. Perhaps you could have been the one to help pass on my power to the next generation of priestess. She smiled lightly as she saw Fu's gaze harden slightly before waving the girl off congenially. Maybe, but as you said, my heart is with someone else. Cheyenne nodded, the sad smile on her face sliding away as Fu settled back down, still eyeing the priestess carefully. I almost wish I could come with you. I think it would be amazing to travel so freely like you do. Naruto chuckled as he rubbed the back of his head sheepishly. You make it sound so glorified, there's a lot of sleeping in forests and long days of walking too. Cheyenne just smiled softly, gently laying a hand on Naruto's chest, a small part of her knowing this would be the last time the two would see each other for a long time. Oh, I don't think that would be so bad as long as you share it with people you care about. Naruto just nodded, it was what made his life bearable having those people by his side. 
But I must say, this land will always need its priestess, Moria was not the only evil to call this place home. She looked up, a slightly hopeful look in her pale purple eyes. But perhaps you could stay, you would always have a home here, recognition from the people and... She leaned forward so she could whisper into Naruto's ear quietly, I think I would be okay with sharing. Naruto's eyes widened a little as he took a step back, just the tiniest hints of a blush spreading over his face. I... I am... He took a moment to collect himself as Cheyenne smirked, glad to have finally gotten a rise out of the young monk, even if it wasn't quite in the way she had originally intended. I'm afraid I couldn't, I still haven't fulfilled my purpose in this life yet. Cheyenne just nodded with a sad but still satisfied smile on her face as she stepped back, back bowing slightly to each of the teens. Then I wish you the best of luck, remember you are always welcome in Oni no Kuni. All of you. Naruto just smiled as he stepped back to join his friends. Thank you all for everything you have done for this land and its people. Naruto nodded again and was about to turn around when Cheyenne placed a hand on his shoulder. Wait. One last thing Naruto. The young monk was a little surprised when Cheyenne took the bell off of her jacket and held it out to him. I want you to have this as a token of thanks. Naruto froze, his hands immediately coming up to refuse the gift, it meant too much to Cheyenne. I I couldn't, it was your mother's, and we already accepted the pay you were going to give to Kanoha. Naruto wasn't exactly proud of that but Cheyenne had insisted, after all their supplies had been dwindling lately. Cheyenne just smiled softly, prying open Naruto's hand and gently placing the small glass bell on his palm. No amount of money could ever repay what you have done for both this country and for me. Behind them Taiyuya was about to speak up, no doubt asking for more money, luckily Haku managed to grab her and place a hand over her mouth before she could ruin the moment. So instead have this, and always remember me through it. It has lost its power anyway, thanks to you it now resides within me again, as it should. Naruto froze for a moment before allowing his hand to close around the little trinket, a light smile on his face. Of course, thank you Cheyenne. He reached around, placing the pin of the bell through his hair tie and securing it in place, he experimentally shook his head and Cheyenne had to giggle as he let off little jingles with every movement. How is it? The younger blonde simply smiled and nodded. It's perfect. This time Cheyenne turned to Fu, surprising the Jinchuriki as she walked over to her, making sure to look her right in the eye. Orange met purple for a few moments of terse silence as the two girl girls stared each other down before Cheyenne spoke in a low, hushed whisper. I hope you understand just how lucky you are to have somebody like Naruto. Fu just smirked back at the girl challengingly. Every single day. Cheyenne nodded once approvingly as she stepped back, never breaking eye contact. Good because I'll be right there, ready to step in if you falter. The two continued staring at one another for a few seconds before they broke away, I wish you all a safe journey back home, wherever that may be. Taruho will escort you to the docks where I've made sure there is a boat waiting for you. Naruto nodded thankfully as the two groups parted, a small part of him wishing he really could take the girl up on her offer. After all, it was hard saying goodbye. Naruto sighed as he allowed the gentle rocking motions of the boat relax his body, his eyes dropping contentedly as he sat up on one of the sails of the surprisingly large vessel. They had left Oni no Kuni a few hours ago, and after the usual scuffle for rooms each person had gone off to explore the ship. After a while Naruto had found himself up here, for sitting next to him as the two enjoyed the serene air, gentle noises of the sea, and a comfortable silence. So, Naruto, what was it Cheyenne whispered to you? Naruto nearly fell off the high beam as he turned to full with a small bead of sweat on his temple. What had happened to the comfortable silence? Um, it was nothing, she was just wishing me good luck, that sort of thing. He chuckled nervously as Fu stared at him evenly for a good few moments, her orange eyes boring unblinkingly into his own. Naruto. The blonde just chuckled again nervously as her monotone, deadpan voice caught his attention again. You are a terrible liar. The monk's head immediately dropped down again, however, he was a little surpri surprised when his chin was caught in Fu's hand, 
the girl forcefully bringing his eyes back up to meet with hers. And you are lucky I don't care. His ringed eyes widened in even more surprise when the girl suddenly ducked in, stealing a quick kiss from his lips. However, they immediately became lidded as she deepened the contact, sliding her tongue out to gently pry at his lips. Naruto gladly allowed her entrance, slipping his own tongue out as the two began vying for dominance. Even though she began the kiss it was Fu who gave in first, moaning lightly as Naruto began to explore the inside of her mouth as he had so often done during their time on the island. It had taken them a while to come to understand their feelings for one another, but both were in agreement when it came to the physical side of their relationship. For two attention-deprived and generally unloved orphans like themselves it was something they had been sorely lacking from their lives, and they threw their heart and soul into it. Geez, would you two get a room or something? The whole ship can see you from up here. The two quickly broke apart, their faces sporting identical blushes as Taiyuya's voice cut into their making out. They looked over at the girl, straddling the sail on the other side of the mast from them, and both glared at her, making the older redhead raise her hands defensively. Whoa, don't get your panties in a twist lovebirds. Naruto just sighed as he ran a hand through his hair, his ponytail had come a little loose during their kissing. Why are you up here Taiyuya? The volatile former Odo Kunoichi just grinned as she punched a fist into her palm. I was, I was looking for femboy, bastard took the bet again, and I was just looking for him to recommend he take a little swim in the sea. Naruto just leveled and even look at the girl while she grinned defiantly back, she lived for riling people up after all. A person is only really honest with themselves when they are well and truly annoyed after all, at least in her mind. Well, he isn't up here. Taiyuya just smirked as she stood up, showing amazing balance as she stood on the thin pole without even using chakra to cling to the surface. Well duh, I go that. She was about to drop back down to the deck when she looked back over the pair, still smirking at their slightly flustered appearances. Fuck, why don't you two just do it already and get it over with? All this mushy will they won't they crap is just lame. She laughed at the two's blushes as she dropped down, easily dodging the shuriken Fu threw at her from seemingly nowhere. For a while the two sat in silence up on the beam, trying to get what the redhead had said out of their minds. However, after a minute or two Naruto finally looked up, a hint of pink dusting the bridge of his nose. You know, maybe she isn't wrong. Fu's head shot up so fast you would have thought she'd given herself whiplash. W what? It was rare to see Fu flustered, or even showing her emotion in any meaningful way but right now she was about as embarrassed as you could visibly get her. Naruto just smiled sheepishly as he rubbed the back of his head, finding it particularly hard to meet Fu's eyes. Well, I love you and... He didn't get much further as Fu suddenly launched forward, capturing his lips again in an intimate and deep kiss. It was almost three breathless minutes later before they finally parted again, for practically straddling the blonde at this point. Please, say it again. Her voice was low and a little husky as she panted, trying to catch her breath after the heated kiss. Naruto just stared up in, in shock, never having really seen this side of Fu to this extent before. I I love you. Fu just smiled with her eyes closed, taking in the moment before breathing out a long breath, a rare smile alighting on her face. Both of them were so caught up in the moment that neither noticed when the sky above them darkened considerably. I love you too. Her voice was barely a whisper, and it almost surprised her how easy it was to say it. She had thought that such an offering of trust and intimacy would be difficult to say yet, looking down into Naruto's deep violet eyes, it was the easiest thing in the world. This time it was Naruto who initiated the kiss, reaching up to gently cup the mint-haired girl's cheeks and guide her down to his lips. They stayed in that embrace for a long time, or it could have been a few seconds, neither was really sure. However, when they finally parted, rain had begun to fall heavily, soaking their clothing. Wow, this rain came out of nowhere. Finally having somewhat snapped out of their stupor by the sudden and bitingly cold rain both teens looked up, noticing the odd storm clouds that had appeared overhead. That's weird. Naruto could have sworn the skies were clear a few minutes ago, yet now they were overcast with dark, 
dangerous-looking clouds, and the seas were choppy. Below them the sailors had begun to scurry about, changing the rigging and making sure things were secured on deck for the apparent storm that had come out of nowhere. Fo suddenly turned down to the blonde, a new blush staining her cheeks that was mirrored by Naruto when he realized just how wet her thin clothing had become. Maybe we should go inside. Naruto gulped at the implication of the otherwise innocent statement. He was so caught up in it that it was only at the last moment he managed to grab Fo and throw her away, just in time to get her out of the way as the place where they had been sitting was engulfed in a bright explosion. Real, actual lightning struck the ground in a thousandth of a second, which was why Naruto considered himself lucky to have only been at the fringe of the blast as he fell awkwardly to the deck below, his right arm twitching as blue arcs of electricity ran across it. Chakra-based lighting was one thing, but the real thing? He couldn't absorb that. Damn it Kakuzu, I told you that stupid idea to get a Rayal lightning storm going was a dumbass idea. Naruto groaned lightly as he got to his feet, using his shikuju as support, looking over through narrowed eyes at the two men approaching him through the smoke caused by the various fires erupting over the deck. Above them the mast slowly collapsed, making a slow arc through the air before practically slicing through the ship from its weight. His vision was a little blurry from the smoke, but he could make out the bright red clouds emblazoned on their cloaks easily enough. Ayakatsuki The one at the lead of the two, a man with slicked-back silver hair, and a large tribladed red side slung over his shoulder, grinned as he walked forward. And look Kakazu, the little runt recognizes us. The man behind him, a much larger, more imposing figure with most of his features covered, merely stayed where he was, even as the ship around them burned. Shut it Haydn, I'm still annoyed with you for constantly killing the crew of our sh ship. We would have been here days ago if you could just control yourself for once. You wasted my valuable time, and as they say, time is money. The first man just snorted dismissively, swinging his scythe about experimentally, as he continued to walk forward. It at least gave Naruto time to collect himself, allowing him to work on healing the damage the lightning had caused. He cursed at not having sensed it earlier, but lightning struck from almost two kilometers in the sky and it happened so fast. Plus, he had been a little distracted. Ah, eh, those heathens? They were barely worth the blood on my blade. A hungry look overcame his features as he looked around at Naruto. The blonde had managed to straighten himself out but he really wasn't looking forward to fight two Akatsuki members in his condition. Already he was working on gathering Senjutsu, but with the involuntary muscle spasms in his arm it was proving difficult. This one on the other hand, he would make a glorious sacrifice for Jashin-sama. He took a stop forward but found his path barred by his partner, a firm arm held in front of him. You are not to kill the target Haydn, we get paid for bringing him in alive. Haydn just grimaced as his hand tightened around his scythe. He raised it up to hit Kakazu out of the way, but of course lifting up a long metal rod was the worst possible thing to do in a lightning storm. Naruto was once again blinded as a bolt of pure white lightning struck the idiotic Akatsuki member, the resulting explosion blew both him and Kakuzu in opposite directions from the man. Not only that, but the energy from the strike finished the work the fallen mast had started, started, successfully tearing the vessel in two. Naruto saw none of this though as he was violently thrown overboard into the thrashing waves of the stormy sea. He tried to flip his body so that he could land safely on the water, but unfortunately for him another arc of pain rushed through his body as the lingering aftereffects of being in close proximity to two different lightning strikes reared up. He lost control and plunged straight into the broiling waves, finding himself tossed and turned about underwater by the violent and unpredictable currents beneath the waves. Finally, when his breath was burning in his lungs, he broke the surface of the water and managed to climb up onto it, his legs a little shaky, but his control quickly returning. Immediately he looked around, but was a little shocked to see he had lost sight of the boat somewhere in the confusion. He wasn't sure how long he had been pulled under the water or for how far, but with his ability to sense through the water being disrupted by the irritating electricity in his system he couldn't find out. Normally he would simply jump up and try and spot it amongst the roiling waves, but as the Akatsuki member had proven, being high up in an ongoing lightning storm was a terrible idea. 
He took a step forward, nodding when his foot didn't sink into the water before taking off at a run. He had no particular direction, but he generally went with the direction of the large, rolling waves, hopefully that would be the way the ship had gone, or at least the remains of it. He considered summoning his friends, after all, if he had survived then that other Akatsuki member probably had, and that meant Fu was still in danger from them. However, he couldn't be sure what condition they were in and didn't want to risk bringing them out here to the middle of the ocean. He resolved to simply run faster and hope he could get to some form of land fast enough that it wouldn't be an issue. Unfortunately for him it was almost two hours later before he finally found land and by that point, he was severely drained, even his large reserves weren't infinite and two hours of pure water walking took its toll. However, on the plus side, when he finally staggered onto the shore he could see evidence of the ship, bits of wreckage, and wood that had washed up on the sandy shores. Taking a moment just to catch his breath and make sure he had gotten rid of the last traces of that lightning he quickly molded his chakra. Kuchios. He slammed his hands down, waiting with bated breath, however nothing happened. The usual ceiling matrix did not appear, in fact, it felt as though something was blocking his chakra from actually spreading out in the desired way. He frowned, figuring his control must still be a little off as he tried again, only to get the exact same result. This time his brow furrowed deeply as he stared at his hands, wondering just what that lightning strike had done to him. However, before he could try for a third time he couldn't help but look towards what he assumed was the center of the island where he could feel a large amount of chakra gathering for something. Welcome one and all. I am your game master Hiroto Misaka. Of all the things the blonde might have been expecting it certainly wasn't for an enormous projection of a man almost a mile high. He spoke with an enthusiastic, eccentric tone, only backed up by the odd clothes he wore. It seemed to be an all-white suit with a very high-collared white robe that fanned out at the back. Going with the theme his hair was also a startling white, spiking out in random directions to give him a slightly crazed look. However, his eyes, hidden partially by a set of re rectangular glasses, glinted with the light of a conniving intelligence. Now that all the contestants have arrived, I would like to formally welcome you all to Yuza no Kuni. The projection grinned broadly, pausing as if for some invisible audience to cheer or clap. However, the news still startled Naruto a little, he was on Yuzu no Kuni? That meant the place where the man was projecting his image from was probably Yuzushi Ogakure, nearer the center of the island. This was where Anoka had gone wasn't it? I know, I know, you must all be excited and confused but fret not. The man enthusiastically raised a hand to the sky, a much more significant gesture considering the projection could actually reach into the clouds. The rules for this little game are very simple. You, the contestants, must fight one another in order to progress further into the island. You will meet in pre-designated areas guarded by special seals, the instructions given by the seals must be followed or the consequences will be. The man grinned a more devious smile, unpleasant. His expression lightened up again quickly as he clapped his hands together excitedly. However, for the winner only riches and wonders await in the ruins of Yuzushio itself. You may notice that you are unable to use your chakra, those are the legendary seals of the Uzumaki themselves, they span the entire island. You will only be able to use your chakra in one of the designated areas for fighting. The massive projection began to flicker and fade, obviously running out of chakra to power it. Now, good luck contestants. I have high expectations of you all. The man gave a final grin as the projection finally faded away into small specks of light, his final words echoing across the entire island. Let the games begin. Chapter 72, Clouds X Tayuya grumbled to herself as she walked through the island's unnatural, unnaturally thick forest, ducking under low-hanging branches and slicing through the irritating vines that hung in her way with a kunai she always kept tucked into her waistband. First, she wakes up on some godforsaken jungle island, floating on a stupid piece of driftwood, then she finds she for some reason can't use any chakra. Next that massive projection tells her she's entered some kind of messed up fighting tournament across the entire island? Just what the hell was going on here, and why hadn't Naruto summoned her yet? 
She just continued to mutter profanities to herself as she stalked through the foliage, hoping to get some answers in this Yuzushio place the projection mentioned. It was her own fault really, she saw those two Akatsuki guys on the boat and just had to rush in to try and help Naruto. Being caught on the edge of a full-on, genuine lightning strike was bloody painful, she could definitely attest to that. She never noticed as she crossed an invisible line on the ground that began to glow as soon as she stepped in, however, she definitely noticed the slight hum as a very complex seal activated. Acting on instinct she dashed to the side, expecting some kind of trap like an exploding tag or a barrier, well, she was half right anyway. After a moment of nothing happening, she looked up, blinking in surprise when nothing appeared amiss. Just to be safe though she turned back, looking to skirt this area in case there was some other trap that wasn't a dud. However, to her intense surprise and immediate irritation she didn't take more than two steps before crashing into some invisible wall. Arg damn it! She bounced back off whatever it was onto her ass, sitting there, there for a moment just rubbing her forehead. When she looked up against, she saw the barrier she had stepped into slowly fade away, only an almost invisible ripple in the air revealing where it had been. Experimentally she reached out and brushed her fingers along it, marveling when floating kanji sprung up wherever her fingers made contact with the invisible wall. Taiyuya was no novice when it came to sealing, Orochimaru had always told her she had certain knack for it, especially barriers. However, the sheer complexity of this warding barrier was so unbelievably beyond her she couldn't help but just stare for a few moments. Kanji flowed from one array to another like an ever-moving masterpiece, all done in flawless calligraphy that simply hung there in the air, impassable. So was this one of those pre-designated fighting areas that stupid projection had talked about? Taiyuya turned and walked a bit further into the sealed-off area, trying to remember what the white-haired crazy guy had said. There was some kind of condition she had to meet, right? Or some rule she had to follow? Taiyuya groaned piteously, suddenly wishing she had paid a little more attention rather than just writing the man off as insane. H.A.U. She looked around, eyebrow raised as someone new made themselves known. It was a large man in the typical dress of a sailor. Taiyuya didn't recognize him, but he was probably from the crew of the ship they had been on, figures she would get someone like this as her first opponent. Hey, you were on the ship. What's going on here? Who was that white-haired guy? Why can't I leave this place? Taiyuya just sighed as she slipped her flute out from her chest bindings, confusing the man as she spun it in her hand once. Didn't you hear the guy you moron? We have to fight to get closer to the center of the island, and knowing Naruto and the others, that's exactly where they're heading. The man still seemed confused causing Tai Yuya to grunt with irritation as she brought her flute up to her lips. Her lips. Ugh seriously, it means that I'm moving on and you're going to sleep so pipe down already. The man continued to stare confusedly as Tai Yuya played a quick melody over her flute, the rich tones drifting about the clearing as he just stood and watched her. What are you doing? Tai Yuya paused in her tune, taking the flute from her lips as she blinked in confusion she was definitely molding her chakra into the sound waves yet for some reason they were dispersing almost as soon as they left the instrument. She might as well have been whistling instead. What the hell? She stared at her flute in surprise as it had never stopped working like this before, however, in her momentary pause the man seemed to get over his own shock, staring down the much smaller girl. So what, we have to fight? Then I can get the hell out of here? Taiyuya looked back up, slipping her flute back down into her bindings, as she took up her taijutsu stance. She may not be able to use her flute, but she could still kick this civilian's ass, she had just wanted to be quick about it. Oh wonderful, we have our first contestants. Both of them paused as the silhouette of the same man who had projected himself over the island appeared between them. It was hard to tell who it was as the figure was blurry and indistinct with no colors or visible features save his outline, but the wild and spiky hair gave it away somewhat. Hey you, let me out of here you asshole. Taiyuya tried to hit the man, but her fist went straight through the insubstantial projection, almost falling over as she suddenly lost her balance. Ah, I know you must be excited to begin, but there must be some patience first. 
After all, I haven't even set the rules for this little fight, have I? Ah, I know. The man suddenly crouched down, messing with something by his feet that the two contestants couldn't see due to the limitations of whatever projection technique he was using. Using. There, perfect. Both Taiyuya's and the man's eye were suddenly drawn to the normally invisible wall of their barrier where a few kanji had lit up in a deep, ominous red. No chakra? What the hell does that mean? While the sailor was confused Taiyuya understood perfectly, somehow this barrier could be altered from some base point, negating or limiting certain aspects of whatever was inside. Sure enough when she tried to channel chakra into her limbs it refused to respond to her, in fact it was a little bit painful to try. What the hell, give me back my chakra. The projection of the man simply turned to her, or at least Taiyuya assumed it did, it was hard to tell when it had no eyes or discernible face. Oh, but then that would hardly be fair don't you think? The projection chuckled, an irritating, mocking laugh that set Taiyuya's nerves on edge as it slowly began to fade away. Good luck you two, there are other games that await me. Just like that he blinked out of existence, leaving the two alone again, however, this time it wasn't a kunoichi and a civilian sailor, but a very large, very brawny man and a much smaller, physically weaker girl. Arg damn it. I don't care about this shit, I'm getting out of here, and if that means through you so be it. The very large man suddenly rushed the younger redhead, however even without her chakra Taiyuya was still trained in taijutsu, and she was easily able to sidestep him, almost wanting to laugh as the man barreled straight into the invisible wall of the barrier. Ah oh man, I can't believe I was worried there for a second, it's like fighting a toddler. toddler. She slipped back into her stance with a mocking chuckle, her slight concerns by the man's size and her sudden lack of chakra eased. The man simply turned to her, rubbing his forehead and glaring at her. He took a swing at her with one of his big meaty arms, but Taiyuya easily slammed it aside, using the man's misplaced momentum against him as she slipped around him, soundly striking him on the back of the neck. Puffed too easy. The man slumped to the ground, completely knocked out as Taiyuya stepped forward and looked towards where the barrier still displayed the no chakra rule. All right Hitoto or whatever your name was, drop the barrier. I won, didn't I? She didn't get a direct answer from the man or one of his projections, but the barrier slowly faded away in front of her, the hum dying down to nothing. The redhead just smirked and strode forward, breaking into a jog as she headed further inland, she wanted to get this whole game thing over with as soon as possible. However, she had to groan as a few minutes later she took a step over yet another invisible boundary, he familiar hum starting up behind her as she walked into yet another barrier. Ah damn it! She stomped her foot on the ground and was a little surprised to see a small crater erupt from the contact. The former Otokunoichi grinned as she felt her chakra return to her, flowing through her body like a warm, revitalizing elixir. All right then, bring on the next weakling Hitoto. Almost instantly the projection of the man buzzed to life next to her, and despite its lack of face she could almost feel the irritation radiating off the man. It's Hiroto. He collected himself quickly, coughing into his hand as he gestured, gestured further into the forested area. And I believe your newest opponent has just joined us. Taiyuya looked to where he was gesturing, expecting another civilian sailor to come stumbling out of the tree line. However, her eyes widened in shock when her opponent finally did walk out, she couldn't believe what she was seeing. Damn right I'm here. And you better be more of a challenge than all those other heathens, I can tell Jashin Sama was displeased by their pathetic sacrifices. Fu frowned as she dusted off her hands, yet another of the sailors that had populated ship lay behind her, swirly circles in his eyes from the swift blow Fu had dealt to the back of his head. She knew Naruto had to be on this island somewhere, something this crazy going on would undoubtedly have drawn in the blonde's incredible penchant for unbelievable situations. She wasn't sure if it was bad luck or good luck that brought him into all this craziness, however she did know she had to find him. The Akatsuki members could be here as well and she probably didn't stand a chance against both of them if they managed to find her. Naturally the first thing she did after the boat sank, or at least what had remained of it had, was take to the skies in order to find one of the others. However, they had been scattered and, in the storm, 
it was like trying to find a single pebble in a pond. Then she had managed to find the island, or Yuza no Kuni as Hiroto had called it, however almost as soon as she passed some invisible boundary around the country her wings had just faded away as she lost control over her chakra. It was only thanks to the large leaves of the forest breaking her fall that she hadn't broken something herself. Now she had been forced to enter some ridiculous game as the madman had said, playing around with people's lives, forcing them to fight, it was barbaric, not a game. However, she had no one to voice her opinion, opinions to so she simply moved on, dashing off as fast as she could into the forest as soon as the barrier came down. She remembered the first conversation she had with the projection of Hiroto, for the most part she had ignored him which seemed to really get to him. After that it had been one opponent after another as she slowly worked her way inland. Hiroto seemed incredibly annoyed by her lack of reactions to his various attempts at weighing the fights against her with his ridiculous rules. First it was taking away her chakra however she had been trained to fight in such conditions before and was barely phased. Next, he had taken away her sight however the man she was fighting was similarly affected as the so-called rules of each barrier appeared to be indiscriminate. Likewise, she had swiftly won that fight too, easily finding the man as he panicked over his loss of vision. Finally, in the last fight she had been forced into by Hiroto, the man had not only taken away her chakra, but increased the gravity within the barrier by almost five times the normal amount. The white-haired maniac had hoped that because of her smaller build the much larger sailor would have been at an advantage, Fu quickly disproved that idea. And now here she was, running as fast as her chakra-lacking body would allow her towards Yuzushio, hoping to find Naruto there. She did almost sigh as she crossed the invisible threshold of yet another barrier, wondering just how many opponents she would have to face before she could reach Yuzushio. However, to her confusion as she walked further inside she could hear what seemed to be a conversa conversation. Quieting her footsteps and taking it slow she crept forward, peeking out around a large tree to see a rather strange sight that instantly put her on edge. Standing in front of her, facing away from the mint-haired girl, was a man wearing an Akatsuki robe. Damn it I'm bored, we've been waiting here for almost an hour. Fu frowned though when she got a better look, it wasn't one of the ones she recognized that attacked the boat, not to mention this one seemed to be part plant. Large Venus flytrap-like extension rose from his shoulders, and his hair was a rather shocking shade of green. Which coming from her was saying something. Well, whose fault is that huh? Toby told us to simply observe and yet here we are, trapped in this stupid barrier without even a way to get a message to him. Fu's frown only deepened when another voice emerged, seemingly from the same man, only it was darker and raspier, much more unpleasant to listen to. It's not my fault. You were the one that wanted to get in closer. Fu took a step back, the Akatsuki member seemed heavily unstable considering he was actually talking to himself with two different voices. How was I supposed to know that the Mayfly technique wouldn't work once we were inside one of the barriers? Fu's eyes narrowed as she tried to come up with a way of getting past this Akatsuki member. Usually by now Hiroto would have shown up in one of his projections, but he was conspicuously absent right now. Well, you shouldn't have underestimated the Uzumaki then, you know Madara-sama always talked about how irritating they could be with their few injutsu. At that Fu froze, one did not need to be a walking encyclopedia of shinobi to know the significance of the name Madara. Yes well, it seems it doesn't matter anymore as our opponent has finally resolved to stop hiding, any? Fu jumped backwards into the air as a massive wooden vine suddenly burst out of the ground beneath her, trying to ensnare her. She managed to keep her composure as her wings burst from her back, keeping her hovering in the air, but inwardly she was beyond shocked. First this man talks about Madara Uchiha, then he goes and uses something suspiciously like Moko Mokotan? Oh, I was sure that would have caught her. The first, lilting, slightly effeminate voice seemed genuinely disappointed, in an almost childlike way, as the Akatsuki member finally turned to the Jinchuriki. Fu saw for the first time that the man seemed to be completely divided into a white half and a black half. Then you are naive as always, can't you see this is the Nanabai Jinchuriki? Toby warned us about her. 
Fu's eyes narrowed again, wondering who this Toby person was and how he was so knowledgeable about her. If there was one thing, she had come to genuinely dislike it was lacking information. Oh dear, I don't think we're ready to face a real-life Jinchuriki, we never were the frontlines type. The black half of the man just seemed to growl his agreement. What should we do? Fu didn't really appreciate them talking as if she wasn't there however, she couldn't really do anything until the rules of the barrier had been set up. For all she knew she could be in mid-attack and completely lose her chakra. She couldn't risk that without knowing more about this Akatsuki member's techniques and fighting style, however, from what she had seen it didn't bode well for her. A Mokutan user was like a Jinchuriki's worst possible opponent. Quiet idiot, I'm thinking. However, Zetsu didn't need to think much longer as at that moment the wall of their barrier rippled, the new rules of the fight appearing in bold red kanji. Hum, two enter, one leave. Both halves of Zetsu seemed to grin viciously at that. Perfect. Perfect. Fu watched with increasing disgust as the Akatsuki member suddenly shucked his cloak, revealing that the divide between them covered their entire body. However, before her eyes the man-thing began splitting down the middle, into two completely separate halves. Fo had to contain her look of revulsion as thing, as it certainly could not be human after doing that, fully separated, each new half regrowing the missing leg but not their other arms. For a moment the two just stood there, flexing their new legs and suddenly independent arms before the black half grinned. I hope the game master doesn't mind too much if we bend the rules a little, after all, there aren't just two of us anymore. With that the black Zetsa began to sink into the ground, his presence vanishing entirely. Fu could only gawk for a moment before the tree she was hovering in front of suddenly moved, the branches suddenly swiping out to grab her. She zipped away but it was close, the wood was surprisingly fast for having just been an inanimate plant. When she stopped, she spotted the white half of Zetsa still on the ground, a part of his foot seemingly merging with the earth as it grinned playfully up at her. I may not be a combat-type Jinchuriki-chan, but don't underestimate Zetsu's power. I am the land itself. Naruto steadied himself with his shikuju as he walked, using it to support himself. Whatever this seal was that was affecting his ability to use chakra was having severely debilitating effects on him. For someone like him, so used to having massive amounts of chakra running through his system on an almost daily basis it was incredibly disconcerting to have it so easily ripped from him. Although whatever it was didn't actually seem to affect his ability to mold it, as it hadn't affected the 8 trigram seal on his stomach, that would have been dire. For some reason his preta path seemed unaffected by it all, and if he wanted to he, he could easily absorb the chakra powering this island-wide seal. However, that would have been severely inadvisable as right now, he could only absorb chakra, not expel it. To absorb such a massive amount of chakra only for it to have nowhere to go, he would more than likely explode. Without disabling the seal as a whole, it would be pointless to siphon off little parts of it, not to mention the fact it must have something feeding chakra into it or such a massive, complex array would quickly lose energy. He had to admit, the Uzumaki that created it surely were masters of their craft, having so long to work and play with few Jutsu, they must have come up with countless scenarios to prevent people simply circumventing them as a whole. As he moved further inland his respect for them only increased, things that were invisible to others were lit up like glaring neon signs in his eyes. Almost everywhere he looked seals littered the island, some looking old enough to stretch right back into the warring clans period. The best part for him, or possibly the worst considering his current situation, was that he couldn't recognize a single one, they could literally do anything. As he walked, he noticed he wasn't encountering any of these so-called pre-designated areas Hiroto had mentioned. Not only that but small signs of civilization began to become apparent, the occasional, the occasional fallen pillar covered in vines and shrubs or the broken remains of a statue, the face long since eroded away. The air was incredibly serene and as he walked he couldn't help but simply enjoy the air, he could see why this had been chosen as the ancestral home of the Uzumaki. He didn't really focus on it, but being here, actually standing amongst the ruins of this civilization, that small, childish part of him that had yearned to know about his family growing up was being rekindled. Finally, the forest began to give way to stone paths, 
littered with the signs of nature beginning to reclaim its lost territory. Here and there he could see evidence of what might have been buildings, small homely structures that had long since been torn down by either war or time. Occasionally he would spot that recognizable spiral that so marked the Uzumaki clan, carved into the walls or on a faded, ragged banner. He closed his eyes for a moment, just trying to imagine what it must have been like to stand amongst this small village in its prime, with the walls still standing proud and fresh, colorful banners fluttering gently in the breeze. He released a breath he hadn't realized he had been holding as his eyes opened again, that image in his mind fading as it was once again replaced by ruins and shattered stone. He shook his head as he continued on, his footsteps softly echoing around the small outskirts village. He paused though in the middle of the road, looking up at the massive, seemingly endless wall of floating kanji that stood in front of him. It glowed with its own unearthly light, seemingly stretching on infinitely in both directions. He quick quickly realized this must be one of the fighting areas Hiroto had mentioned and also guessed that you weren't supposed to be able to see the barrier itself, otherwise it would be a fairly obvious trap. It made sense he guessed, the only documented Dijitsa capable of seeing chakra other than the Rinnegan, which was thought to be extinct anyway, were the Sharingan and Byakogan. Both of those were solely in the possession of Kanoha, an ally to Yuzushi Obikure, so naturally anybody else would be at a disadvantage against them. Naruto frowned for a moment, considering circumventing the barrier entirely, however, it seemed to go on for quite a distance both ways he looked and he really needed to get to the center of the island quickly so he could try and put a stop to this pointless game. With another few moments of deliberation, the young monk finally stepped through, watching with interest as a ripple of light spread through the kanji where he touched the barrier. Sometimes he forgot how truly blessed he was to be able to see this invisible world of chakra and how beautiful it was. Excellent, excellent. You know I knew there was something special about you the moment the sensory seals picked up your chakra levels, I've been waiting for you to enter one of the battlefields this whole time. Almost as soon as Naruto entered the barrier a wispy, indistinct silhouette of the self-proclaimed game masters buzzed into life besides him, a grin on his non-existent face. Hiroto. Naruto inclined his head to the man, no need to be impolite to the man that effectively, or at least seemingly, controlled the entire island through its seals. Oh and so, so polite too. The projection of the man seemed to lean against something wherever he was projecting from, the action made him look like some sort of mime. Ah, uh, you know I've been dealing with curses and screaming all morning, it's rather refreshing to talk to someone level-headed like yourself. Naruto could somehow feel the grin the man was giving him as he talked, the blonde just took the opportunity to walk forward, further inland. Naturally the projection followed him, even if Hiroto himself wasn't walking, it just seemed to glide along beside him, keeping perfect pace. So. So. What do you think of my little game, eh? Excited? Thrilled? Angry? Disheartened? Do tell, I love seeing what people make of my brilliance. Naruto just rolled his eyes as he walked, his shikuju and the bell in his ponytail jingling along to his steps, it just had to be an egotistical narcissist, didn't it? That one man with the scythe was my favorite, he seemed so happy about the whole concept. Naruto almost faltered by he caught himself, passing it off as a small misstep, the Akatsuki with the scythe had survived. But Naruto had clearly seen him get struck by lightning, no, it had to be someone else. Why? What is the point of it all? The projection just looked at him for a moment as if considering the words, although it was very hard to tell what Hiroto was thinking when his face was hidden like it was. Isn't it obvious? I wish to simply show people what is inside their own hearts, nothing does that like pushing the boundaries between life and death. There was a moment's pause as Naruto actually though the man was being sincere before the projection chuckled. Plus, it is all very amusing. I have to do something to pass the time you know? Naruto just sighed as they finally reached the other side of the barrier, he looked up at the massive wall of kanji and frowned. He couldn't just wait here for some opponent when his friends might be in danger elsewhere. You see, see it don't you? Hiroto's voice pulled him out of his thoughts as he realized he had been staring at the barrier for a few long seconds. 
Do you see it? The beauty of the seals? The Uzumaki really were artists you know, constructing something as magnificent as this. Naruto blinked as he looked around and spotted the projection staring up at the barrier as well, even though the blonde was positive he couldn't actually see the chakra. You didn't create it? The projection scoffed, throwing a dismissive wave the monk's way as he turned back to Naruto. Of course not, I am brilliant yes, but the expertise and the sheer genius of the Uzumaki clan is still beyond even me. No, this was created long before I stepped foot in this country, I simply commandeered it for my own use. Naruto nodded slowly, it made sense, it would take years to set up something this complex and ingenious all over an island this large. What was its original purpose then? Once again, the blonde could feel the projection grinning at him in response as it waved a hand at him, finger pointed up tauntingly. Ah, I wouldn't ruin the surprise, you will have to simply seek me out in Yuzushio. And with that the projection faded from existence with a small buzz of static. Naruto stood there a moment before sighing, it was tough being courteous with such an obviously insane man. After a moment or two he reached forward to touch the barrier, reaching out through his predipath to absorb the chakra powering it. However as soon as he tried to do that his eyes widened in surprise, where he touched the barrier the floating kanji turned a sudden and startling red. A moment later he had to grit his teeth in pain as a lance of electricity shot from one of the kanji, shocking and numbing his arm. He breathed heavily, severely irritated by the amount of times he had been shocked recently. Although he had to admit that it was yet another in ingenious move by the Uzumaki that had designed the barrier. All forms of chakra-absorbing jutsu were just that, designed to absorb chakra. Nobody would be expecting them to seal actual lightning or electricity as a defense mechanism. Given enough time Naruto was sure he could get around it, but fate had decided not to give him that time as a presence behind him made itself known. You know, for the amount of time you have managed to elude the Akatsuki, you aren't exactly subtle. I could hear your shikuju and that little bell from almost a mile away. Naruto turned with a pleasant smile on his face to look up at the tall, imposing figure of a tan-skinned man with most of his features hidden by a cowl and a cloth face cover. However, his interesting green eyes, backed by deep maroon scara, were perfectly visible as they stared down at the blonde, Kyubi Jinchuriki. Haku sighed as he finished creating the ice restraints for what must have been the fourth or fifth sailor he had come across and had been forced to fight. Naturally he had taken them all down as swiftly and as painlessly as he could, but it was beginning to grow tiresome. At least he was making decent progress into the island, they were just civilians after all, not on the same level as Shinobi, even with his chakra taken away. As the barrier faded away, he dashed off into the jungle, moving as fast as he was able, he may have kept a calm and cold exterior, but he was worried for his friends. Almost two hours and he hadn't seen a single sign of them, they had to be involved in this sick game as well. Finally, finally he breathed a small sigh of relief as in the distance he heard a very familiar string of profanities echo through the air. Immediately taking off in the direction, he could hear Taiyuya, he dropped down a small cliff face, rolling to cushion the fall. However, he almost blanched as he looked up only to see a practically labyrinthian construction of degraded buildings and shattered walkways in front of him, no doubt the remains of some fringe town to Yuzushio. However now it might as well have been built as a maze because without chakra it was going to take him a while just to get through it. The sounds of fighting he could hear in Taiyuya's direction didn't do anything to ease his mood as he took off trying to pick what he thought was the best path he could through the twisting, dilapidated streets. After a few wrong turns though he finally seemed to get on the right track, he skidded around a building that was in slightly better condition than the others and crested a small hill before he finally caught sight of Taiyuya's long red hair. As he got closer, he saw she was fighting an Akatsuki member, and that alone made him pick up his pace. However, something seemed to be wrong, Taiyuya was just standing there, unmoving, and the Akatsuki was doing the same, standing on some kind of red symbol on the ground. However, before he got any closer he ran into an invisible wall, kanji rippling out from the contact. His paused in confusion though as the Akatsuki suddenly lifted the long, extendable spike he was holding and plunged it straight through his own heart. 
For a moment he thought Taiyuya must have gotten to him with a jinjutsu and won, and he breathed a small sigh of relief, only for it to die in his throat a moment later when Taiyuya collapsed to her knees, clutching her chest. No. He could see the redhead cough up blood while the Akatsuki member stayed standing, a sick grin on his oddly transformed face. He pulled the spike out of his own chest like it was a toothpick, eagerly licking up the blood staining the tip as Taiyuya fell even further, struggling to support herself on one hand before she finally fell forward. Even from this distance Haku could literally see her breaths coming out slower and slower. Taiyuya Chapter 73, Clouds 11 What the fuck? How are you still alive? I watched you get roasted by that lightning bolt. Taiyuya stared in shock as Haydn walked forward, the man's Akatsuki robe was completely burned away at the top, only leaving tatters to hang around his waist and expose his torso. Likewise, his hair looked a little more singed and frizzed than it had before, and it looked like a poor attempt to smooth it back down again had been made. However other than that, and unbelievably for the redhead, he looked perfectly okay. He didn't even have a scorch or a burn mark anywhere on his skin. Yeah, and I'm gonna get that bastard Kakuza back for it when I catch up to him, that asshole caused my talisman to melt. He put his hand to his chest where a small metal, something, hung on a severely singed wire around his neck. It may have been something recognizable once, but a few thousand volts had seen it turned into nothing more than a warped metal lump. Similarly, the scythe held comfortably and the man's hand was worse for wear, the blades themselves seemed okay but the shaft of the weapon itself was a little twisted and deformed from the intense heat. And no way, there's no way you could have walked out of that without a scratch when your weapons took damage. Taiyuya took a step back, some base instinct in her body telling her to get far away from this impossible freak of nature. However, at the same time Haydn's eyes gleamed like a predator as he swung his scythe flamboyantly before slamming the end onto the ground. Of course, you heathen. Jashin-sama has bestowed his gift on me so that I can continue to offer him sacrifices forever. His head dipped lower as his grin became more vicious, the firm grip he had on his scythe tightening until his knuckles went white. Now come, share in the sweet ecstasy of pain with me. Taiyuya took another step back which made Haydn's grin only widen, the smell of fear becoming thick in the air. However, the redhead quickly caught herself, shaking off the strange vibe she had been getting as her features reaffirmed into her natural skull. Fuck off you freak. Haydn just laughed up into the sky as he twirled his staff into the sky, catching it as he took a loose but confident stance. That's right, it's no fun for me or Jashin-sama when they go down easily. Fight for your life, make the blood you spill on the floor even sweeter for Jashin-sama. Taiyuya growled lowly, trying to block out the man's hysterical shouts as he slipped her flute out from her cleavage in a swift movement, bringing it up to her lips before Haydn could even look down. When he did, the silver-haired cultist blinked in mild confusion as a sweet, haunting melody drifted throughout the clearing. E.H., sorry harlot, Jashin-sama doesn't take musical offerings, only blood. The Jashinist suddenly rocketed forward, grinning as he swung his scythe in a wide arc to cut down the redhead's front, he didn't want to kill her after all, not yet anyway. However, he stumbled when the Taiyuya in front of him faded away, her body breaking down into ash and dust that just floated away, unaffected by his swing. The man looked around for a few seconds, slinging the weapon back up onto his shoulder as he casually glanced about, waiting for the inevitable counterattack. Pretty neat trick girly, but did you really need the stupid flute to do it? It a fucking cooler instrument, like a guitar. He whirled around, striking out with his scythe as he felt a presence behind him, only to gawk as the gleaming red blades passed straight under the disembodied upper half of his opponent. Taiyuya just grinned as her torso floated there, dust and ash streaming from where her legs should have been as she spanned the flute between her fingers, even though the melody seemed to continue on without her playing. Get a clue freak, the flute's the best instrument there is. As if to prove it the floating redhead suddenly lunged forward faster than Haydn could react and jammed the long metal instrument straight into his eye. The silver-haired scythe wielder staggered back, clutching the metal pipe as he cried out in pain and anger. Arg damn it! 
Taiyuya suppressed a grimace as almost immediately the man pulled the flute out of his eye socket, blood and viscera spurting from the wound as he put a hand up to cover it. Ah fuck you bitch. That actually fucking hurt. However as shocked as Taiyuya was before it was nothing compared to when the man took his hand away, revealing his eye was now perfectly fine, if not caked with blood. The Jashinist wiped away the fluid covering his eye and grinned, sw swinging his scythe again. I knew you were going to be fun, your sacrifice will definitely please Jashin-sama. Taiyuya took a step back, or would have if she wasn't just a floating torso. What in Kami's name are you, you freak? Haydn suddenly gained a look of intense rage as he lunged forward, looking to viciously bisect the redhead down the middle. However, his scythe met no resistance as Taiyuya's body once again dissolved away into ash and dust. Don't speak that blasphemous god to me. Jashin-sama is the one true lord. Haydn glanced around again for his slippery opponent however he wasn't left hanging for long before the ground beneath him suddenly exploded upwards. Vicious black chains burst from the ground, each adorned with barbed blades or gleaming metal hooks that almost instantly drove themselves into the Jashinist's flesh. He cried out again as skin and muscle was torn open by the deadly chains, screaming profanities to no one in particular as Taiyuya reformed in front of him. Now stay down you freak. She watched him for a few more seconds as the man panted raggedly, looking down at the ground as the rest of his body was immobilized by the tautening chains. However, the red head couldn't help but take a step back as his head suddenly shot up and the cultist grinned at her madly. His hair was caked with his own blood and a thick stream of it dripped down his face between his eyes, making him appear crazed and deranged. No no no. I don't think you understood you bitch, we're supposed to share the pain. Right now, I'm taking it all myself. Taiyuya frowned as even more, ch more chains burst from the earth grabbing onto every open bit of flesh on the man until only his head remained, appearing as though it was sitting on a small pile of dark black metal. Man, I wasn't expecting a genjutsu, that's such a fucking cowardly technique like that bastard Itachi uses. Before Taiyuya knew what was happening Haydn suddenly reached down and viciously ripped out a chunk of his arm with his bare teeth. The world around them suddenly shattered, the chains breaking away into nothing as Taiyuya's form snapped into focus, no longer streaming ash and dust. She was so surprised by the manner the man had used to break her genjutsu she couldn't react in time as he rushed forward, grabbing her by the throat and throwing her clean across the clearing. She managed to turn in the air and just about land horizontally on a tree, but she couldn't rest at all before she had to suddenly lean back, watching as three gleaming red scythe blades sheared through the air in front of her face. All of a sudden, she was locked in a deadly game of don't get hit by the vicious weapon wielded by the religious nut as she dodged, ducked, dipped and dived to avoid being diced into little Taiyuya pieces. She didn't even get an opportunity to raise her flute to her lips again as Haydn was just too fast for her. Her salvation came as Haydn began to get cocky, giving larger, more flamboyant swings that gave her the opportunity to suddenly grab the massive scythe and use the man's own momentum to push him over her shoulder. Damn it bitch, just hold still, this is starting to get annoying you know. Taiyuya ignored the man as she jumped back, bringing her flute up again as she began a frantic melody. Haydn blinked as the ground beneath his feet seemed to melt away as if it had suddenly turned to quicksand. His entire lower body slowly sank down into the mire-like substance as the trees around them broke down and scattered to the winds. He grimaced as he brought his scythe about awkwardly having to struggle in order to pull it out of the strange swamp the genjutsu had put him. Arg this ain't going to work on me again bitch. He brought the gleaming scythe around and raked it violently across his chest, gasping from the pain but grinning as the genjutsu world faded away, freeing him. He laughed as he saw Taiyuya still crouching across from him, looking down at the ground as she stayed oddly still in a three-point stance. Man, I thought you would at least run or something bitch. Did the heathen finally decide to sacrifice themselves to Jashin-sama? Taiyuya finally looked up, confusing Haydn as her body began to change strangely. I wouldn't count on it you fucking freak, just had to keep you busy for a minute. Before the Jashinists' eyes Taiyuya's skin darkened until it was almost the color of chocolate, 
her hair lightened at the same time, becoming a pinker color. Finally black marks appeared under her eyes like little spikes, as if she had been crying black tears. That was all he got to see though before Taiyuya suddenly launched forward moving so fast that she just seemed to flicker a moment before pain erupted in Haydn's head. Man, I still can't get used to how good this feels compared with the curse marks level 2. Taiyuya stretched her neck out as she flexed, enjoying the feeling of nature chakra running through her body, strengthening her and enhancing her far beyond her normal limits. Damn it bitch, that was a hell of a punch. Taiyuya's eyes widened as Haydn walked out from the smoking crater she had launched him into, steadying himself on a tree stump he had crashed through on the way down. Taiyuya just growled as she shot forward again, once again appearing within Haydn's guard faster than he could possibly react. In mere seconds she unleashed a devastating volley of senjutsu-powered punches all over his body, before finally grabbing his scythe and throwing the man over her shoulder. Arg. He crashed into the ground with a small shockwave blowing out due to the force of it, Taiyuya smirked at the crater his body had made in the earth only for it to drop of her face as he suddenly coughed. Seriously, there's no need to make this so fucking hard, one way or the other I'm sacrificing you to Jashin-sama. Taiyuya took a step back as Haydn picked himself up, cracking his neck one with a sickening pop. There was no way he should have been able to get up after that it would have shattered most people's rib cages at best and severed their spine at worst. What the hell you asshole? Stay fucking dead already. Taiyuya was on him again, wrenching the scythe out of his grip before turning it around and driving it soundly into his body. Haydn's eyes widened and he spat out a long stream of blood as the pole of the deformed weapon broke straight through his sternum. However, Taiyuya didn't stop there, she kept driving the shaft through the man's body, until it completely skewered him, allowing her to lift him off the ground like some sick sh shish kebab. Heh, not good enough heathen. Taiyuya cried out as Haydn suddenly lashed out at her with an extendable spike he had hidden in the tattered remains of his robes hanging around his waist. She dropped the hold she had on his side to grip her arm, trying to stem the bleeding from the nasty cut he had give her. Ha! It's finally over. Taiyuya took a few steps back as Haydn dropped to the ground, quickly picking himself up. The redhead just couldn't believe what she was seeing, Haydn was just standing there with his scythe driven right through his body like it was a splinter. She couldn't figure him out, it just wasn't possible for anybody save maybe Orochimaru and other freaks like him that had done something twisted to their bodies. This guy had to have some kind of unbelievable healing factor to take injuries like this as though they were nothing, or even be standing after them. No, Taiyuya frowned at that, no kind of healing factor would save you from a direct lightning strike, that was just unnatural. What the fuck are you? Haydn just grinned, a gleam in his eye as he brought the spike up to his mouth, still dripping with her blood from where he cut her. I already told you heathen. I bear Jashin Sama's blessing, because of him I am immortal. He laughed before languidly licking a long line of her blood off the pointed weapon. Taiyuya just tried to process that, stunned for the moment, there was no way this guy could really be immortal, could he? However any chance of her trying to convince herself it was some kind of trick were dashed when Haydn suddenly grabbed the handle of his scythe, still sticking out of his abdomen, and wrenched it out. A deluge of blood poured from the wound as the man bent over, griping the bloody weapon with slightly trembling hands. Ha! Now that's what I'm talking about. Share in this pain with me heathen, be cleansed by it before Jash- Jashin-sama. Haydn suddenly straightened up and despite the large splash of blood across his chest there was no indication of a wound of any kind. Taiyuya was frozen as her mind simply struggled to come up with an explanation for what she was seeing. However unfortunately for her that was ample time for Haydn to draw out a large symbol on the ground using his blood that he had just spilled. It looked to be some kind of large circle with an inverted triangle at the center, and he drew it with his foot, using well-practiced, sweeping strokes. This is it bitch. Slowly his tan skin faded into a deep, obsidian black as white markings that looked like bones appeared all over his body, as if tracing out the skeleton beneath his flesh. Standing there, with his scythe and hand dripping with blood and the devilish markings that appeared over his body, the man could have easily been mistaken for some kind of grim reaper, 
come to collect her soul. Finally, though Taiyuya had enough, snapping out of her shock as she growled, shaking her head to rid herself of the chilling feeling that had come over her. Put on some makeup have we, freak? Haydn grinned maniacally as Taiyuya suddenly rushed him, not even bothering to move out of the way as her blow struck him straight in the stomach. However, in the exact same instant Taiyuya's eyes bulged out as her body was thrown back as if by some invisible sledgehammer. She skipped along the ground before rolling to a stop, blinking away her shock as she staggered to her feet, clutching her stomach as pain racked her body. She looked over, spotting Haydn doing the same, at least her punch had managed to do something, the markings across his body had vanished. Do you feel it? Haydn staggered to his feet, still grinning even as he spat out a wad of blood, he sprinted back to the symbol he had marked on the ground even as Taiyuya rushed to intercept him. Do you feel the pain we share? She was too late, as soon as he stepped inside the mark the markings, the markings returned, faster this time, and in flash he took out the spike again, and swiftly jammed it into his thigh. Taiyuya could only cry out as her leg exploded with pain, causing her to collapse to the ground. W what have you done to me? She managed to get back to her feet, but her leg was shaking badly, threatening to give out beneath her. Slowly blood leaked from a stab wound in her thigh, in the exact same place Haydn had stabbed himself. Don't you get it yet heathen? We are linked now, you and I. It is yet another gift Jashin-sama has bestowed upon us unworthy beings, so that we can share in the agony and ecstasy of pain. Slowly he traced the spike up his arm, drawing out a thin trail of blood that almost as soon as it appeared was gone. Taiyuya wasn't so lucky, and had to grit her teeth as that same cut appeared along her own arm as if drawn by some phantom blade. Slowly the markings that defined her sage mode faded away as the nature energy in her body ran out, and a whole new pain exploded through her as the full force of her injuries caught up to her. Unfortunately, I don't have my prayer necklace anymore, so Jashin-sama will have to forgive me for cutting this sacrifice short. Taiyuya's eyes widened in horror as the man slowly brought the spike up, pointing it back down at his own chest. You were a worthy sacrifice harlot, but now it's over. Taiyuya tried to move, but her legs just wouldn't respond to her. It was in vain though as only a second later the Akatsuki member brought the spike home, impaling his own chest in one swift and brutal movement. Taiyuya. Taiyuya. She faintly heard the scream from behind her as she collapsed forward onto her knees, however, before her body could fully hit the ground she found herself in a warm embrace. Opening her eyes she found herself staring into Haku's chocolate orbs, frantically examining her body. However Taiyuya had hung out with Naruto long enough to know that her injuries were fatal, no medical ninjutsu save from probably Tsunade herself could save her right now. Why you were a little late, shithead. When she looked down she saw that half of Haku's body was emerging from an ice mirror that had congealed on the ground in almost an instant. She tried to chuckle, but it only came out as a racking cough that sent spears of white-hot pain through her body. Suddenly Haku shifted, collecting her into his arms as he sank back into the mirror, the feeling was disconcerting, but through the pain and the numbness slowly encroaching over her limbs Taiyuya barely noticed. No, no Taiyuya, you have to hold on. She almost wanted to laugh as Haku frantically looked over her injuries, green medical chakra flickering over his hands. With a great deal of difficulty, she lifted an arm and pushed away one of his hands, the action feeling far too weak for her liking. Why you re an idiot, you know tea that. Taiyuya wasn't sure if the wetness on her cheeks was from her own tears or the ones dripping from Haku's eyes. She tried to ignore it though as she reached up, grabbing the front of Haku's kimono suddenly and pulling him down. The brown-haired Yuki's eyes widened as he suddenly found his lips pressed up against Taiyuya's in a rough kiss. Slowly though the redhead's grip on his clothes loosened as the kiss lost its force before finally her head dropped back, unable to support itself anymore. H ha, I wanted to de-do that once before I k-kicked it. Taiyuya's eyes were beginning to droop now, they just felt so heavy while her body just felt so numb. Haku was shaking as he stared down at her boy, watching her breathing become, become shallow and irregular. He knew he had to do something, anything, 
but he just didn't know what, however, as he watched more of Taiyuya's precious blood spill from the wound in her chest his eyes hardened. He could still feel the warmth of her lips on his as he began to gather huge amounts of chakra in his hands. He really hoped this would work. Fu's wings beat furiously as she flew straight down towards Zetsu, using her flight advantage to come at him from above. However, her orange eyes widened as an enormous vine burst from the earth, wrapping around the strange white humanoid like some kind of wooden cocoon. She tried to abort her dive, but ended up brushing her foot against the wood as she did a mid-air turn. She winced as her control over her wing constructs was shaken, and she banked too much on one side. She just managed to twist her body to land on her feet, but she still skidded back a few meters, digging little trenches with her heels. It's useless Jinchuriki-chan, I know you'll defeat me sooner or later, but I need only by time for the other me to find your friends. Not only that, but your Bijou Chakra is useless against my Mokutan, even if it can't compare to his. Zetsu's voice came out muffled from behind his wooden barrier, but the lilting, childlike tone was still evident. Behind her, Fu's wings dissipated into a sparkling dust of chakra as water began to collect around her hands. Quickly two long swords almost half the size of her body condensed in her hand, each with a gleaming edge that betrayed their element's liquid state. Then I will end this quickly. Fu's eyes set as she dashed forward, dodging and flipping over the multitude of vines that burst from the earth to try and ensnare her. Though she couldn't avoid she cut clean through, sometimes spinning to sever the tentacle-like wooden protrusions. Protrusions. Finally, she touched down in a crouch only to immediately jump up, missing the vine that would have wrapped around her feet. Mid-jump, she twisted, stabbing her liquid swords into Zetsu's wooden shield and dragging them up as she completed the arc of her jump. Her feet touched the ground on the other side just as the great wooded cocoon split open, collapsing to either side to reveal a shocked Zetsu. Wow, you really are stronger than I thought Jinchuriki-chan, this is a fun fight. Fu merely maintained her dispassionate expression as she turned on a heel, jabbing her swords forward to skewer the white man-thing. However, one step away from him she suddenly funds her movements restricted, she was so close she could make out the individual green strands of Zetsu's hair. Oh look! It finally happened! Zetsu seemed excited even as Fu continued to struggle against whatever was holding her back from stabbing him. Ugh. She grunted as she felt her chakra slowly being siphoned away. Zetsu had quickly backpedaled away from her when she realized she was immobile so she risked turning her head. What she saw disgusted her, surrounding her body was what appeared to be a thick white sludge that was constantly growing and changing around her. Worst of all it seemed to have a face, more than one in fact, or at least the malformed mockery of faces. She could tell it was slowly sucking at her chakra, trying to drain it from her. Do you like it? They grow from spores I managed to plant over your body when the fight started and slowly siphon away your chakra. Fo took a calming breath as she managed to straighten up, fixing Zetsu with a chilling glare as her mind whirled to find a way out of this. Who's so scary Jinchuriki-chan, maybe by the end of this I could get a little smile out of you? Fu's eyes nearly narrowed dangerously before they gleamed with slight amusement, a smirk appearing on her face. They absorb chakra? Zetsu just grinned and nodded happily as his foot once again merged with the earth. However, his smile became smaller as the white gelatinous mass surrounding Fu's body suddenly froze, unable to grow anymore. Slowly the white began to turn gray as the previously smooth texture of Zetsu's spore clone became rocky and rough. Hey hey Jinchuriki-chan. What are you doing to it? Fu merely remained still as cracks began to appear over the clone's body. After another few moments large portions of it simply fell off, shattering when they hit the ground. Zetsu's eyes widened and he quickly ran through hand seals, trying to take advantage of Fu's immobility while he could. However, it was too late, as massive wooden roots burst from the ground to ensnare the girl the last of the spore clone dropped away, completely turned to stone and Fu was able to jump up high over the roots, wings once again bursting from her back. Oh, hey that's no fair Jinchuriki-chan. My parasite clones can't handle nature chakra like I can. You don't have to be so mean. 
Fu frowned as she stared down at her opponent emotionlessly, it was like fighting a child. Although I am impressed you know Senjutsu. That's a really hard skill to learn you know. The mint-haired Jinchuriki quickly ran through her options before nodding once, taking a deep breath and before exhaling in massive cloud, enhancing the jutsu with the tiny amount of nature chakra she had managed to channel in the short time. Ooh pretty! A bright, sparkling dust spread out from her breath, practically blanketing the ground below in a glittering layer of gold. Zetsu only, only had a moment to admire the beauty of the technique before he had to shield his eyes as light was reflected over and over and over again inside, becoming blinding. Fu watched on from above, immune to the blinding effecting of her scale dust technique, slowly, almost languidly she held up the tiger seal. In flash of light the scale powder blanketing the floor suddenly ignited in a massive explosion that caused Fu to move a bit as the turbulent airwaves created by the blast buffeted her wings. Slowly the smoke dissipated and the dust settled, revealing the ground below had been blackened and scorched by the technique. Cautiously Fu fluttered down to the ground, touching down as she kept a wary eye on where Zetsu lay on his side, his white body scorched in many places and his arm twitching. Slowly she walked up the manplant thing, checking around for traps and deceptions before she found herself next to him, looking down at the odd creature. Oh, so mean Jinchuriki-chan, I wasn't expecting that. The humanoid's voice came out a little raspier than normal as he coughed a few times. But then again. Zetsu's head suddenly shot up to reveal he had a complete face as opposed to the real Zetsu's half-face. Gotcha. Fu was suddenly trapped from behind as the real Zetsu melted out of the ground, quickly wrapping his arm around her neck in a choke hold. However, the creature was a little surprised when Fu did nothing but smirk, a low chuckle coming from her mouth. No, I'm afraid it's the other way around. Zetsu's eyes narrowed as he looked at the girl in front of him a little closer before suddenly widening. Shadow CLO dash he got no further before a long watery sword burst through his face from behind causing his body to jerk violently. Fu allowed her feet to touch down softly, her wings folding back into her back silently before dissipating. You may have been able to sense anything touching the ground, but I don't have to if I don't want to. Zetsu couldn't reply as Fu allowed her water blades to dissipate into the air at the same moment the Fu in front of them burst into white smoke allowing the plant man to fall limply to the ground. She stared at him a moment before looking at Zetsu's clone, now melting into a puddle of disgusting white sludge. Finally, she just wiped her hands with a sigh and turned to leave, however out of the corner of her eye she spotted a small gleam of metal and stooped to pick it up. It was a ring, it looked fairly harmless, but it was embedded with a small green stone and bore the kanji 4 guy which was often associated with in elements. With a shrug she pocketed it, she had never really been one for the spoils of war, but it had caught her eye, perhaps she could get it resized to fit her. Around her she heard the hum of the barrier fading, and without another backwards glance she darted off back into the forest, she could tell she was getting closer to Yuzushio now. I don't suppose we could talk before launching right into fighting, do you? Naruto had to crane his neck a little to look up at the massive man standing in front of him, he really struck quite the intimidating figure. It depends on what you have to say Kyubi Jinchuriki. Naruto just cocked his head to the side with a lilting smile. You could call me Naruto if you want. The large man simply stared at him with his dispassionate green eyes with the odd red scara. Naruto, Kyubi. The name doesn't matter as long as I get paid. Naruto simply raised an eyebrow as he leant against his shikuju, he was glad he could at least speak with certain members of the Akatsuki. So, you are a mercenary? The former Taki Shinobi simply snorted, the veil covering most of his features rippling slightly. I suppose, although I care little for titles, a better word for me would be entrepreneur. My name is Kakuzu. Naruto looked up thoughtfully at that, he could have sworn he had heard that name somewhere before, he may have had a near-perfect memory, but sometimes something just got lost in the filing, as it were. Now enough talk. I have wasted enough time oh this island dealing with weaklings not worth my time. I have to deal with you and go find my partner before he does something else idiotic like hold a conductor in a lightning storm. Naruto sighed lightly as he took a step back, 
planting his shikoju into the ground firmly. So, there's no way we could resolve this peacefully? Kakuza stared at the young monk interestedly for a few moments before shaking his head. Not unless you have a few million Ryo in your robes, which I doubt. Naruto raised an eyebrow at that. Really? Money? Kakuza just nodded and for a moment Naruto considered it. Would it really be that morally wrong to create money just to get rid of a problem? The blonde side as his master popped up in his head, metaphorically thwacking him over the head for even considering it. Know this Kyubi Jinchuriki, I am not so sorry. I will not underestimate you like he did. I've lived long enough to know that any power that can harness the bijou such as Hashirama's Mokutan or the Uchiha Sharingan or those Rinnegan eyes in your skull are dangerous indeed. Naruto simply nodded with a sigh, taking a deep breath before his eyes snapped open, pulsing with chakra. Very well. That's it for this reading. Hit like and subscribe for a free ticket pass going to the different worlds of anime fanfictions. Looking forward to having you on board again.